So I guess I'm not going to do that. Oh, okay. I was asking. Oh, okay. 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 Okay, so I, I, I forgot to uh, click some button in my office so I can't give you a Socrat I've got a Socrative quiz written, but I can't actually make it available. So um, I'll make it available uh, later today and leave it up for overnight and stuff like that and you can still do it. Okay. Okay, so, oh, oops, just a sec here. <laughs> okay, so Okay, a try again. Okay. So um, I made a bit of a mistake with uh, setting up the repos this morning, so uh, I have to undo all that. So I've got. So if you try to do a repo now, what will probably happen is it will uh, say you can do it, and then at the very end it will fail. So so don't don't go trying to make, collect the repo or anything like that until I make a. Uh, uh, email out to you saying it's ready to, to go, okay? So I made, a mis I made a mistake and I've had to sort of shut it down, but I only shut down part of it. Uh, reminder that we have quiz two coming up uh, week today, so that's next uh, Monday. Um, it'll cover everything from the, la the end of the last quiz material to um, DNS and performance metrics, assuming we get to performance metrics, which I think we should. Okay. Um, there's a practice uh, quiz two available. It's been visible for a couple days, so you can check that out. And uh, the answers should be visible on Wednesday. Okay. And then I was going to try and do this today, but I didn't figure out how to actually do it. Uh, so uh, after some suggestions that perhaps what I should do is uh, pre-post some of the day's slides. So what I'm going to do. I'm going to try and do that, but I don't make any promises that they will, how accurate they will be because one of the issues is, is I try to revise, well I do revise the slides in that and it could be the case that what I want to uh, present or what I put up there I may decide, no I don't want to do that today at the very last moment or something like that. So you have to be uh, aware of that and also there may be slides in there that could have essentially answers to some of the things that we want to talk about in which case uh, I will leave them blank because it doesn't make a lot of sense for you to say, you know, tell me about five things that are of interest to you on this subject and then on the next slide I list ten things for you to read back to me. So that wouldn't make a lot of sense. So we'll try that and see if that works and that might give you something if you want to take notes against or something like that. Okay? All right. So today uh, we're looking again at performance and naming. So we'll be looking at DNS. And so the readings for DNS are in section 2.5. And then for the next class with respect to uh, performance metrics and stuff like that, you should look in uh, sections 1.4 to 1.44 of the textbook. I realize that that's not posted on Piazza. Um, I just happened to look on there because I went there and say, okay, I know what's coming up. Here's what you should be reading. And I'm going, oh, that's not in the list of things I have for you guys to read. So um, I will put that up there as well. It's right out of boundary. Okay. So our big topic today is going to be DNS. That's the section 2.5 stuff. So what I want you to be able to do after today's class is trace how DNS resolves a name to an address. Okay, so print out all of the steps that have to go through to do that. That will be particularly relevant to assignment number two. And also how to go about uh, tracing the results that you get back when you do that. Or tracing the results, I should say, interpreting the results that you get when you do that. Okay. So recall that DNS is a service that maps names to IP addresses and it's also this case study in building a scalable distributed system. So last class we looked at 
uh, a little bit about this hierarchy of servers, but recall what we wanted to try, or part of the reason for structuring it this way was we wanted to try and give administrative autonomy to those people who own particular sets of names. We wanted to reduce issues along the lines of single points of failure. We also wanted to reduce the uh, issues associated with latency and also perhaps with uh, high bandwidth usage of particular routes in the internet and stuff like that. And so the basic idea that was proposed was that what we'll do is we'll have a number of root name servers. Okay? So there's more than one root name server. There's a whole collection of them and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So we have a bunch of root name servers and then we have a number of top level domain name servers as well. And so those are the things that are for .org, .com, .d, uh, .dns, .ca, and the maraud of other ones that have now shown up. Uh, there's like, I don't know, .XXX and stuff like that as well. So there, who knows what's out there anymore. I know there's .museum or something like that too. So the basic idea is that the root DNS name servers, they're well known. So you have this problem that if you want to do a lookup of something, you have to sort of, well, where's the first place I want to look at? Where do I want to start looking? Right. So the idea is, well, we'll always start looking at the root, these root servers. So you can actually go to, there's a site you can go to and I'll have the URL later. You can go to that and it will actually give you the IP addresses of all of the root DNS name servers in the world. Okay. So, and if a, if the IP address of a DNS name server is going to change, they actually announce this and they announce it literally months in advance of when it's going to happen. And so there's actually an announcement now, now saying that at the beginning of December some particular name server is going to change its IP address. And the basic idea is, is then if you want to write a name server, what you're supposed to do is you go to this site and you get a list of all of the IP addresses that correspond to name servers and then you populate your uh, client that looks them up with those addresses. And presumably if you're uh, also keeping your software up to date on a regular basis and things like that, that when someone announces a change in their IP address for a root DNS name server, you would update your software appropriately. Well, usually it's not software, it's just a file that you read in. Okay. <coughs> so that's what, how that worked, that part works. And then, for, so that means that all the DNS servers are fixed. There's a fixed they have the same sort of content and then they just tell you where the other top level domain name servers are. So something like CA, org and that. And then those ones, your top level ones, tell us about particular domain name, well, they call them domain managers or domain name servers. So it's like ubc.ca, cbc, freebsd, ibm, google and so on. Yep would sort of fall into that category. Yep. So are you saying that all root DNS servers are mirrors of each other? Oh yeah, so all root DNS servers are in fact uh, mirrors of each other. They're supposed to be mirrors of each other. Okay. So, and so, and the, the same is true of the top level domain name servers. They're all mirrors of each other as well. So there'll be more than one for, for example, a .ca name server, there'll be more than one of those, but they'll all have the same contents. Okay. Now, over time, I mean, we're going to have to address the issue that says, well, well, what happens if I add something? So, for example, uh, ubc.ca, what happens if a new university comes into being, um, say, uh, Acton U or something like that, and it wants to add it into the .ca domain? Uh, clearly, that has to go someplace, but you can't make it show up at every place all at once. So, how do you know how to deal with that? How do you sort of deal with the fact that these names could become stale or there are new ones and things like that? So we'll, we'll talk about that too. Okay. And then the same issue shows up at places like ubc.ca where there's a lot more churn or more, more name changes and things like that as you get to the roots of these trees or the leaves of these trees, right? There's way more churn in the names. You get more names that being added, more names being taken away, more names having their IP addresses changed and stuff like that. So we have to deal with that issue as well. Okay. okay. So we have things, whoops, sorry. So we have an example there like cs.ubc.ca within that. So this hierarchy then, 
it permits us to distribute the load all over the place. It means that we have a bunch of different root name servers, so they're distributed around the world. You do the same thing with your top level domain names. And then by the time you start to get to the bottom ones, to the leaves, there's not quite as much concern about distributing them because there's not as much, you've, you've now broken down all of that traffic, right? You've sort of done a divide and conquer, and so the number of sites that are interested actually in your names are, are dropping off dramatically. Except, of course, if you're Google. And in which case, you'll have tons of name servers out there. Okay. So just to give you a sense of what's going on here, so there's a co company called OpenDNS that actually has an office in Vancouver. And they um, uh, were apparently recently bought by Cisco. Uh, but they said they, they claimed, this was a couple years ago, that they do 2% of the domain name lookups uh, in the world. Okay, so they're responsible for 2% of them. And so based on that, that, that would work out to about 37.5 million lookups a second going on. Okay. So if you actually go to their website, you can actually get a list from them of how many name lookups they do a day. And I believe they do now someplace on the order of about, uh, if you look at their little graph and if I read their graph properly, they do on the order on, on a weekday of around 75 to 80 billion lookups okay, a day. On the weekend, it drops into the 60s. Okay? And it's, it's kind of interesting to see. It's got this, it kind of, during the week, it kind of is flat, and then the weekend comes and it goes down, and the weekend goes like that. It's got this sort of sawtooth experience. Okay? So if you're doing, think about this. You're doing uh, 35 point, or 37 million lookups a second around the internet. Okay? So, we have the challenge of figuring out which DNS server actually has the right answer, whatever that is, okay? And we want to make sure that we get the right answer, but we're going to have this trade-off between accuracy and performance. So accuracy is a notion that the answer is indeed correct, and performance is the one that says, well, I want to get it quickly. Okay? So a fine example of something like this is a telephone book. Well, okay, so you guys don't remember what telephone books are because you never knew what telephone books were. But a telephone book is sort of like DNS, right? I mean... How, how young do you, do you think we are? Um, <laughs> well, I haven't had a telephone book in my house for about uh, 10 years, so... We're only 10. We're only 10? No. So, but I don't know when you guys have used telephone books, right? <laughs> I haven't used them for a while either. So anyway, they definitely have this notion that as soon as a telephone book is published, it's obsolete. Right? Phone number, the names and people move, their phone numbers are gone, they change phone numbers. And so you have this notion of, well, um, uh, I want to be able to look up phone numbers. So I, look, so I get performance by having my own copy of the phone book. And yet, I will. I have this penalty that, or this issue that it's not accurate. It's accurate most of the time, but lots of times it's not accurate. Okay, so um, that's the same sort of thing here. Is how do we balance those trade-offs between making sure that we get things quickly and yet at the same time the ad answers that we get back are accurate. Okay, so okay, so let's try something here. So um, I have some worksheets to try out. So what I would like you to do, um, let's see here if I get these set up properly. Um, okay, if you could just pass these around. Okay. And then I'll explain kind of what I want you guys to do. Okay, so um, there are a couple programs that you may have already tried or may not have tried 
called DIG and uh, NSLOOKUP. Um, DIG is actually the one that is the most interesting. And what you can do with that is you can go DIG and you give a name. And uh, when you do that, it will report back some information about how it actually looked up the name. So initially it will just give you your, uh, the IP address. So what I want you to do is to go through and sort of, first of all, try a couple of the pings there to get, just do something to get the IP address and then use DIG to get it and look at the different forms of information that come back. Okay. And once you've sort of done that, you can switch to looking at uh, the, the second one there. So there's one ftp.gnu.org and there's also one called prep.ai.mit.edu. So look at those IP addresses. Yep. Oh, we're missing a few sheets. Sorry? We're missing a few sheets. Oh, are there other, um, there's some more hanging around back here. So let's just wait a moment. Okay. So we'll, when you have, when someone has some extras, or the, let me know and I can get them to the people who don't have any. Oh, wait, I didn't take them for myself. Okay. <laughs> so the second one is a slightly different form. Okay, so try those. So just yes. get, so the first few things are just to gather some, inter, uh, some information. And then when you flip it over is actually when the really interesting stuff happens. Okay, so anyone else not have one of the worksheets that wants one? Okay. So just try doing those. Spend a couple minutes doing that and getting some of that information. And then <coughs> once you've done that, flip it over and do the stuff that's on the back. Okay. And if you have any, so what I want you to do is I want you to try and watch where the information comes from. Okay. Try and figure out who's providing you sort of the answers to the information. Okay. Keep in mind the notion of this hierarchy of machines that we have. Okay. And for example, if you look at telus.com and telus.ca, uh, what's different about that? What's the same about it, if anything? Then do the same thing for something, the other ones. Okay. And if you have any questions, uh, just raise your hand and I'll try and answer them. And what we'll do is we'll spend about five minutes or so just doing a few of these. And just, if you have other ones that you want to look at and stuff like that and get back different types of information and that, go ahead and do that. And then we'll also say, okay, we'll also come back and we'll say, okay, well, what did we, what can we learn from this? What is this telling us? How do we interpret this? So what are the steps we need to do to go through to interpret this stuff? It's not that they don't have their own DNS server. What they've done is they've contracted with their own DNS server. Let's say they don't have that. Let's say they do not have that contract. They can't look anywhere. Oh, so if I make tabs, you don't want to say I like that? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Let's say it's not written in the server. XYZ company. It's a really big thing. You have your own DNS I'm not going to do that. 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 I
but they're they the sales of the person. They have to contract with the sales of the server. Yeah, exactly. But if I try to get them, yeah. I'll also go ahead and make sure. Domain name registry, that's what they do. Domain name registry is what they do. No, if I try to get them, the domain name is going to be very high. Oh, yeah. Oh, they may or may not then ask them, okay. but one of the things they have to do at the register okay. is they have to ask you, for example, oh, okay. um, if you bought it from that, uh, so you go to GoDaddy, you go to get help with your dot com. Like their job is to go and tell the dot com folks where to look at Okay, so let's just step back for a sec so, and make sure that everyone understands what they're looking at. Okay, so here's, here I did the TELUS one. Okay. So first of all, observe that there's a, a question section here. So what we have here is we get back a summary of the answer when it did this lookup for us. Okay. And what it's telling us here is this is the, so the way that it works is the client asks a question and then it gets some answers back. That's a big surprise, right? So what it's telling us what the question was, and basically what this is telling us is, I want you to tell me what the internet address, that's what the IN stands for and that's what the A stands for. I want you to tell me the internet address for www.telus.com. That's, that's what the question is. 
So when you send a query out to a server, it always responds back with that. Now in this particular case here, we're getting the, the we're actually getting the final answer that's returned to us. We've not, we haven't gone through all of the steps yet. This is just the final answer. And what this one is telling us is that the answer, and it's telling us here, IN, internet address, 205-206-163.40. That's just telling us that's the address of w.telus.com. And then it tells us some additional information, which in this particular case we can ignore, but in other types of queries we can't ignore, other types of questions we can't. What it's telling us here is these are the name servers that are responsible for telus.com. So dns2.cdic.telus.com, dns1.cdic.telus.com, and then down in the additional section it goes on and it tells us, oh, and by the way, for this particular name, that's the IP address. If it didn't tell you what that IP address was, if it just told you dns2cdic.telus.com, then what you have to do is you have to go and say, well, I guess I better go do a name lookup and find out what the actual address of that thing is. So if it doesn't tell you the address down here, then you have to actually go and start another search right at the top again and look for the address and get back an address. And then once you've got that address back, you can continue with this search. Okay. So, the, so it tells us down here, and then at the, at the very bottom, it tells us, okay, this is the server that I actually initially contacted about this and had it basically do all the work for me, and uh, here's the answer that it gave me. Okay. Okay, any, anything that you observed about that or any questions you guys want to ask about the stuff that you saw? No one want to know what those numbers are? <laughs> pardon? Oh, you want to know what those numbers are. Okay, that's good. <laughs> oh, pardon? Okay, so what do you think they are? Four numbers? No. Good guess, though. They're definitely numbers. Yes, they're definitely numbers. <laughs> oh, yeah. Is it a unique record, I mean, a unique identifier for multiple? for potentially having multiple A records on the same domain? Um, no, it's not a unique identifier. No. Another a good, tr yeah? A time to live. A time to live, okay. So that's what that actually is. So that's a time to live. So what that is, is what they're telling you is, here I'm going to, remember the challenge that we saw? We wanted things to be quick. But we didn't want to, and we wanted things to be accurate. And so this is part of the design of that system to address that concern. Okay, it says, okay, so imagine, well, see that name server 142.103.6.6? I imagine that all of the name servers that you guys did lookups, it was probably that one. If not, there were a few of them. So sitting back in the computer science department, there's some name server, that one. And it's sitting there, and it just got, I don't know if there's like 90 students in here today, let's say it just got 70 requests to look up www.telus.com, okay? And so it's, it's thinking, so one way, look at our hierarchy. One way that you could do that is you could go to the top, and then you could go from uh, the name server, and it says, okay, now you have to go to a com name server. Then you have to go to whoever they tell you for to get the Telus and so on and so forth. So you might have to hit all of those name servers in that hierarchy to get them. And this one is saying, but I already know the answer. Someone just asked it a few seconds ago. Why don't I give them that answer? Well, that's what these numbers are telling you. They're saying, this is how long you're allowed to keep that answer for before you have to re-ask the question. So in this particular case, it's saying you're allowed to keep, use this answer for 3,175 seconds, and then once that gets to zero, you have to re-ask me again. Okay. So that probably actually started out at 3,600, okay, which would be an hour. So you're allowed to keep this for an hour, and then after that, you have to re-ask me the question. And so if you think that the name is likely to change, Right, you're going to set that time to be small. 
If you think that the name is unlikely, the, the name to IP address mapping is unlikely to change, you will set that number to be large. So what you see as you go down the list here, we've got telus.com, which is roughly, and, and the name servers for those are roughly probably originally an hour, and then I can't, don't know off the top of my head what 22,500 seconds is, but it's probably something on the order of 12 hours or 10 hours or something like that. <coughs> Not 10 hours, but something about uh, 12 hours or so, something along those lines. So you can keep them that long and then you have to retry. So that addresses, or it starts to address that concern of, okay, do you want to go to the top all the time? No, if I have the answer, here, I'll give it to you right away. Okay. So we can improve performance that way. We can, so what do we do when we do that? We improve, yep? So, um, sorry, clearly. So the very first time anyone in this room asks to tell us, yeah. the bottom address server would be different, and then every subsequent one for about an hour will be different as well. The times, you mean? No, no, the server, the, you said the one, the DNS server that's doing all the work is the bottom of the server. 142.103.6.6 is the server doing all the work, yeah. Right. So the very first person who asks for tell us gets something, yep. root, and the second person, and the third and fourth, fifth person, subsequent up to an hour, will be different addresses. No, they'll all be the same. Oh. Okay, so what's happening in this particular case, when you're running dig, you're not actually being a name server. What you're doing is you're going to your machine's name server, and you're asking the machine's name server to do the lookup for you. Okay, and so, so they're actually, there's, so there's one level of indirection there. Um, unlike your assignments, in your assignments, you're actually going to do all of it. Okay. So what you've done, in this case, what's happened is you've gone to the name server and said, do the lookup for me. And it's gone to the root, and then it went to whatever uh, the dot com uh, top level domains, then it went to the ones for TELUS and so on and so forth, and eventually it got back an answer, and now it's holding the answer. And because everybody is kind of saying, going to this one spot and saying, do the lookup for me, they're getting back, they'll get back the same thing. So if I actually do this again, well maybe not, just a sec here, I have to switch uh, screen so I can actually see this. Um, Okay, if I do this again, all of those numbers should have changed. Right, so you'll see 1916 now. That used to be up in the 2000s, right? And the other one was like 2900 or something like that. So those numbers are slowly counting down. And eventually they will get to zero. So in this particular scenario, this is not quite, what's happening in this particular case when you use dig is not quite what we, you might be thinking of. So this is the picture that I had on the board. And what's actually happening in your case is there's a machine here, okay, and you're running your program on this machine, and it's actually talking to this machine and asking the name server here to do the lookup. This is actually referred to as a resolver. So it's finding a resolver and telling it to do the lookup for you. And all of you are using the same resolver. That, or when you, if you do it off of like an undergrad machine, you'd all be using the same resolver, which is why you get this. And then this guy here, the resolver would go and ask this level, then this level, and then let's say there, get the answer there, and then return the answer to you. And so everyone after that sees this, well, they, everyone sees the same thing. In your assignments, what you're all doing is writing your own individual resolvers. Okay? And so they'll all, each one will actually sort of go up and talk like that. Okay. Yep? Do you say that sometimes that return to the C names? Okay, so you went to the next part, right? <laughs> That's okay, yeah. So you, okay, so the question was, so, so let me just hold that for a sec. Any other comments or questions about this? Yeah? Uh, why does it have to go to the top level? Why does it have to go to the top level? Yeah. Um, it doesn't, okay? If it knew what the intermediate levels were, it could go straight to them. So for example, when doing the, if the resolver knew the .com one, so in other words, if it had the name servers for .com cached, 
it could go straight to them. If it had the name server for telus.com cached, it could go straight to it. But that's, that's where those times come in. So they would say, okay, it's okay to keep the telus.com one for this amount of time. Once that's expired, then you have to go and start over. So in the worst case, you always have to start over. And then those numbers tell you, essentially tell you how long you're allowed to uh, cache it and then short circuit going to the top all the time. The 142.103, that server, is that the root server IP address? Nope, that 142.103 is the resolver's address. Okay. So now, oh, yeah. Uh, so the DNS one, uh, uh, yeah, the DNS two .cidc .telus they are the name server of? So, so dns2.cidc.telus.com is the name server that returns the answer for telus.com. The stuff on the left hand side, right? So it answered the question, or it's, it's, it, it has authority for everything that ends in telus.com. And so since we're looking for www.telus.com, that's why those guys answered. <coughs> okay, now someone mentioned the, the C name one, right? So if we did dig, whoops, dot prep dot, oh, no www, just a sec here. We do that one. What we get back here is it says a C name. And so it says the, in the answer section it goes prep.ai.mit.edu. You can keep that name around for 652 more seconds. Um, and instead of me giving you an A record there, I gave you a C name record. And that means that the name that you typed in is an alias for another machine. Okay. So C name is there, C name stands for canonical name. I don't know why they just didn't use the name uh, alias, right? Because alias would make more sense to, or be easier to interpret. But C name stands for canonical name. So it says prep.ai.mit.edu is a canonical name or an alias for ftp.gnu.org. And then it actually comes back and tells you that the address for ftp.gnu.org is in fact 208.118.235.20. Okay. So it's summarizing this for you. And then it's telling you in the authority in the additional sections what particular name servers were involved in getting that. Okay. And if you look at the very, if you look at the ones on the bottom in the additional section there, the A versus the quad A's, okay, so the single A is an internet address, well they're all internet addresses. The single A is an IPv4 address and the ones with four A's are IPv6 addresses. So they give, the name server gives you back all of that information regardless of whether or not you can actually make use of it. Okay. I, someone else, I thought someone had a question. Yeah? So the down here when it says server 142.103.6.6? Yeah. Yeah, so what had happened there again is that's my name. So when you run the program dig, it's actually contacting a resolver, which is a low level, it, which is a DNS name server itself. And then, yes, it's going back and doing the work for you. But like, I mean, doing the C name and the name is altered by the resolver. Like, you're not doing it. <coughs> Sorry? You're not doing it twice. You're not getting the C name. Oh, okay. So the question is, when it gave me the C name, I think this is the question. Okay, <laughs> if I'm wrong, tell me. Okay. When I got the name, when I got the C name, which was ftp.gnu.org, did I then have to go and relook ftp.gnu.org up? Right? Okay. So that is actually, if you flip the page over, okay, um, or Okay. Okay, you ignore the IBM stuff. Okay. <laughs> but instead, try the one that says um, do a dig with the plus trace option and the plus no DNS sec options. Okay? And do them for this. No, for, okay? Just do it for this one here. Okay, so if we do that. 
So if I type in here, and you can just kind of follow along with me. Oh, sorry. Prep.ai. Okay, so now what this command is doing, when I give it the plus trace option, what that's doing is it's now going to behave as if it were the resolver. Okay, so it's going to act, so it's going to show us the steps that the resolver would have to go through to actually get us that, that information. Okay, so it's, that's what the plus trace is. The plus, oh, sorry, you don't want no, you don't want plus DNS sec, you want no DNS sec on that one, sorry. No DNS sec. Okay, if you don't, if you just leave that option off, you will get these lines that are really long and convoluted and rather challenging to read. If, and what they are is there's some security information to allow you to figure out whether or not you should trust the information that's in this record. Okay, so it's a signature that's in there that you can then use to figure out whether or not the information is in fact correct. Okay, so we've got no DNS sec there. Okay, and if I do that, You'll observe we get back a lot more information. But this time, it stops at ftp.gnu.org. So in fact, you're right. What the resolver did was when it got to the C name, it then said, oh, that's an alias for this other thing. And now what I have to do is I have to go and look up this other thing. So it has to start over again. And in the worst case scenario, it start over and go to the root name server and it would go all the way down again to get that. And in, in this case in particular, because um, ftp.gnu.org and prep.ai.mit.edu are in fact in two completely different top level domains, right? one's in the .edu, the other is in the .org, there's no overlap in those particular, ser those particular servers, so we can't even short circuit that particular one. We've got to go to the root and come down in all of them. And so if I back up a little bit, we can actually sort of learn some more information about this. Okay, so the first thing that comes back actually, so this, you have to be a little bit careful in interpreting this because that leads you to believe that what you actually get back is a list of all of the root name servers, which is not true. You don't actually get back the list of all the root name servers. That's just the way this stuff always starts out by listing all of the root name servers for you that it could choose from. Okay, so those are all of the root name servers and it'll choose one of them. <coughs> okay, unfortunately here they don't tell us what the IP addresses are, but those are around. And from there it then says, okay, ask one of the root name servers for .edu and from there it'll say, okay, these are the name servers that know about the .edu one, okay? And, back here. So, and it just sort of keeps going like that, okay? .edu and it then tells you here which name server did it use, okay? So it says, I received these answers from the iroot name server, which was 192.36.148.17. So it hides how it actually did that from you. But in assignment number two, you'll actually get information on how to do that. Okay. And then once it's got that, it chooses any of those lists of edu name servers, so G, C, A, B, L, and F that it gets there. It will choose one of them. How you choose, it's up to you, okay, up to the implementer. You may randomly choose one of the ones in there. You may just choose the first one, last one, middle one, whatever you want. In this particular case, we then choose the, it chose the A one, which is sort of one of the middle ones. And it asked that name server, and it got back all of this information about MIT. And then we sort of keep, whoops. So we got, we, that's for the, that tells us where MIT is. Now we go to the MIT ones. Okay, so this one down here, AIMIT.edu, is telling us we need to go to these name <coughs> servers over here. So a couple things to observe. One is that, notice how the times start larger and go down, okay? 
Again, an example of the, these name servers here, unlikely that their IP addresses are going to change, so you can keep them around longer. These ones, on the other hand, more likely to change, so you're only allowed to keep them for a half hour. Although, admittedly, that's even a little bit on the short time for a name server at that level. Okay. And then here it says, oh, by the, and then it's a C name. So now you're done there. Okay. So now what you would have to do is you'd do this. Oops. So if you're, the, if you're the actual name server, if I back up, pro oh what's happened here. If I'm the actual name server, it does the equivalent of this now. It goes, oops. it'll say, okay, well I've got prep, prep told me it was ftp.gnu, so I'm going to type in ftpgnu.org, and so now I relaunch my search again. And this time, we should get back the answer that we had when we did it without the trace on there. And you'll notice this time here, look at the ftp.gnu.org and gnu.org, they're only 300 seconds. So that's only five minutes that you're allowed to keep that before you have to re-ask the question. Okay. Okay. Any questions or comments about that? Yep. When these numbers come up, it's we, just caching it. Is that what it is? The th uh, like the 300 and the 86. Yeah. yeah, that's just that's how long you're allowed to cache it for. On your own machine. On whoever is doing it. Yeah. So if in the case of the resolver, right, which is being shared across a whole bunch of users, that's saying okay, you can keep this for five minutes. The bottom one. And if anyone asks you this question for five minutes, then you can give them this answer. If after five minutes, then I want you to research. What did you dig? We're hitting some resolver that's out there. Well, in fact, you're hitting the one in CS. <coughs> okay. Yeah. So remember in DHCP where um, one of the pieces of information that DHCP g gave back to you was the name server to use? Okay, so that's who you'd be hitting. Okay. And when you do this, they sit on, they hold on to these name server, DNS servers for that much time. That's right. Yeah. When I do the dig from my own machine, I get a different name server. Um, or that, that IP at the bottom is different um, from the one that I do in DA. So you get back, you mean like received 200, you get a different address for ns1.gnu.org? Is that what? Um, or sorry, you get back, sorry. For the older queries without, well, the question is basically, well, why do you need uh, so many? I think the other one is also in UBC. Why would you? Why do we need so many just for UBC network? Why do you need different resolvers for just for UBC network? Okay. So you want? Okay. So the question was, why do you need different resolvers for the UBC network? So one is it's the same sort of reason you do them all over the place. One is to distribute the load. The other is to avoid the issues associated with a single point of failure. Um, we don't know when something might fail, be it the actual machine or network connectivity to that. So you want to have a few of these out there just to deal with that particular situation. What happens when you can't reach your name server? You've all, you, I, I presume you've all experienced this. <laughs> that part, yeah, okay, you're, you're in trouble. But how, what happens? It sits there and you get a spinning icon for a while and eventually it comes back and says it couldn't resolve it or something like that, right? And how long does it wait? Well, depending upon what you're doing, it could be one to two minutes. Um, so what you want to do is if you don't get an answer fairly quickly, you want to try one of these other ones, right? So when you saw this, so that's why they give you a whole bunch of name servers back up in these things here, in this area here. It's in case you can't reach one, try one of these other ones. Okay? And hopefully they can give you the answer. Okay? And then that way you don't pause. If you, on the other hand, if your wire's cut, yeah, you're, ho you're hooped, right? There's nothing you can do. Suppose you're strange and you have the IP address of like some of the sites you go to, you just, even if your DNS server is down, you're fine, right? Yeah, as long, if you know the IP of address of where you want to go, you, you can always get there, assuming that, you know, the wires are working. Yeah, so, so, for, so now what you can do is if you have a, 
you know, a desire to always be able to go to ftp.gnu.org, you can write that number down and, <laughs> and you can type that in instead, right? You don't have to uh, have someone else do it. So ftp.gnu.org. But they're telling you there it's only good for 300 minutes, which means that they might change it. It might move. Unlikely, but they might not. Okay. Okay, so we'll finish this off on uh, Wednesday and we'll start looking at network performance in that too. So let's say if I go to like Facebook or Yeah, we can meet up after two-ish. We have a lab till two, right?
Yeah, that's right. Because it was CNAME and says, okay, oh, it's an alias, so I have to go look up the real thing.